Today, we're going to talk about some major, major redistricting wins for Democrats that could very well mean the difference between a Republican majority in the House and a Democratic majority in the House. And I interview Congressman Jamie Raskin about the January 6th committee, whether Trump will be called to testify, the dangers of the DOJ and attorneys general not moving fast enough, and how he's holding up after his own personal traumatic events. I'm Brian Tyler Cohen, and you're listening to No Lie. We have a lot of good news this week, and we don't get it too often, so... God damn it, that's what we're going to cover. So according to the Cook Political Report's Dave Wasserman, for the first time in the redistricting process, Democrats are potentially set to gain two to three seats through redistricting. And of course, a few caveats. These are predictions, first and foremost. And there are still more states that have to finalize their maps, so the needle could still move in either direction. But as it stands right now, on paper, Democrats are in a position where we could actually see a relative benefit from redistricting. So let's start with some of the biggest redistricting weapons that Democrats are able to use. In New York, where an independent uh, redistricting commission drew the maps, but the legislature, which ultimately has the final say, took over, the maps are going from 19 to 8 in Democrats' favor to 22 to 4 in Democrats' favor. That's three gain seats for Democrats and four fewer seats for Republicans in a state that's probably the Democrats' biggest redistricting weapon. In Illinois, we're looking at two fewer Republican seats and one more Democratic seat, another major redistricting weapon. Uh, maps in New Mexico and Oregon would also add another two seats. Democrats are also benefiting from governors acting as buffers to Republican-led state legislatures. We've seen Democratic governors vetoing maps in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Kansas, which would have been devastating given how extreme those Republicans are in the state legislatures there. And of course, Democrats have benefited big time in the courts. In Alabama, a federal court blocked Republican congressional maps, telling lawmakers that a second black majority district is required. And that would shift Alabama's uh, congressional delegation from six to one, which is where it is right now, to five to two. In Ohio, which I spoke about a couple weeks back, the state Supreme Court struck down the state's congressional maps on a four to three ruling with the Republican chief justice siding with Democrats and finding those maps unconstitutional. And that map was a 13 to two gerrymander as opposed to the 12 to four current gerrymander in a state that Republicans won with 56% of the vote. So now lawmakers have 30 days. If they can't manage to figure out a suitable map, then a redistricting commission steps in. Uh, in Pennsylvania, just before a lower court Trump-appointed judge was set to decide which congressional map to choose, uh, the Democratic majority Pennsylvania Supreme Court stepped in and took over the process. And like, just so you know how much of a bullet we just dodged, this is what that pro-Trump judge's website says, the judge who almost ruled on the maps. Uh, here are just some quotes. She is the only judge in America to order the 2020 presidential election results not be certified. And here's another one. She is the only judge running for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court to be praised by President Trump. So yeah, um, bullet definitely dodged. And finally, most recently in North Carolina, the 4-3 Democratic majority state Supreme Court struck down Republicans' 10-4 gerrymandered maps as unconstitutional. So now it's possible the Democrats could even gain on the current 8-5 maps, uh, considering that this is a state that's basically 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans. So that's where we're at right now. You know, you'd be hard-pressed uh, to say that Democrats haven't caught a ton of lucky breaks and that Democrats aren't being well-served by lawyers like Mark Elias, who are just working their asses off to make sure that these egregious gerrymanders are struck down. And granted, before we celebrate, just know that Republicans still have weapons of their own. We're still waiting on Florida's maps, uh, Texas's maps are still being litigated, Georgia's maps are still being litigated, but there's something to be said for being in better shape than we expected and to take the wins where we can get them. But here is my biggest caveat. None of this is to say that gerrymandering is good. That Democrats were able to at least momentarily put themselves in a good position doesn't mean that we benefit overall from gerrymandering because the truth is that without gerrymandering, imagine how much bigger our majorities would be. We're not a 50-50 country. Our House majority should not be on a knife's edge. Republicans got 7 million fewer votes than Democrats in the last cycle. In the last eight general elections, Republicans won the popular vote once. So like, if we're able to hold on to the House thanks to some fortuitous events, and that's a big if, it doesn't mean that we benefit from this whole process. It just means that by the skin of our teeth, we don't get royally screwed by it. But either way, we still do get screwed. It's still Republicans who net an advantage from redistricting. All we're talking about here is how much we're able to chip away at that advantage and keep our heads above water. And by the way, you could be sure that Republicans are going to call Democrats hypocrites for railing against gerrymandering and yet taking advantage of it themselves. Here's Kevin McCarthy doing exactly that. Redistricting. We're watching what's happening in New York. Well, it's so egregious 
that forever gerrymandering would be known as Jerry Nadler's district. What they're actually picking who they want, where they're going to steal another four seats. The reason why Nancy Pelosi announced she's going to run, and now they're stealing uh, elections in different places by redistricting and gerrymandering these, she believes she can win, even though overwhelmingly the public says they want to change. Well, you know what has happened? You had Eric Holder and Barack Obama go in through the last decade and r run Democrats, left-leaning Democrats, for state Supreme Courts. And they're upholding this egregious maps. Even the left-leaning Brennan Center says this is wrong. 538 says it's egregious. Nobody stands with this map except the Democrats. And it's interesting that they started doing the extreme gerrymandering after Nancy Pelosi announced she was going to run for re-election. They cannot win on their merit and their policies, so now they want to, to rig the system to be able to keep control of the power. And look, to that I say, good. Because remember, it was Democrats who tried to pass H.R. 1, which included a provision to ban partisan gerrymandering. Zero Republicans voted for it, and every Democrat voted for it. Democrats tried again with the Freedom to Vote Act, and again, zero Republicans supported it, while every single Democrat voted in favor. So Democrats are against partisan gerrymandering, but while it's in place, the last thing they should do is unilaterally disarm. And if Republicans are butthurt that Democrats are now showing some small theoretical advantage, then there's not only plenty of existing legislation that Democrats would love to get Republicans support on, but they could pass legislation too. Republicans are lawmakers just like the Democrats are lawmakers. They've got agency. If they don't want partisan gerrymandering, then pass legislation banning partisan gerrymandering. And last point here, despite all of these potential theoretical advantages, just remember that it means nothing if people don't turn out. Let Virginia be a lesson. We could have the voters, just like we could have winnable congressional districts on paper, but unless we turn out those voters, we could still lose. So none of this is to suggest that we've got this in the bag because we don't. Biden's approval ratings as they stand are still low, and we're fighting against history here uh, when it comes to the party out of power's performance in midterms. But a lot can happen in the next few months. Biden's presiding over record jobs numbers. We just saw 7 million jobs added in the last 12 months. That's a US history record. COVID cases and deaths are dropping, supply chain issues and inflation will hopefully ease up, and we could still see some iteration of Build Back Better. So time will tell, but if you needed some reasons to hold out hope, I think we finally have a few. To listen to one of my favorite interviews that I've ever done, that's with Congressman Jamie Raskin, where we discuss whether Trump should be called to testify, the dangers of the DOJ and attorneys general not moving fast enough, and how he's holding up after his own personal traumatic events, click the thumbnail right here on the screen or check out the interviews playlist on my YouTube channel.